God bless you all and welcome to the Rock here in Pine Town and thank you for coming this morning. It's been a bit of a miserable, quiet, uh, misty sort of a day and very damp uh, and we were expecting maybe a lot more rain um, but Jesus is alive in our hearts and, and it's interesting, uh, a couple of things have uh, happened this week and um, one was this morning when, when actually someone said that uh, the word fear has kept been coming through in Bible studies and, and uh, on television programs. And, and it's uh, where we we're told not to fear. Apparently there's 365 times in the Bible where it says do not fear. But we're human. God knows we're human. And God is very intimate with us and he knows that it is a natural thing for us to be uh, of fear and apprehensive, but it's in the fear that we, our courage can come out. It's in our fear where our weakness, when he becomes strong. And that's what the Bible talks about. The other thing was um, where I got uh, a phone call about a lady spoke to her pastor and, and she said, but she just, she looks all around her and, and all she sees is, is terrible trouble and disasters. And she says, there's no, we talk about joy, but how can we have joy? And you know, the joy that we have as Christians is not a everyday emotion. It's knowing the choice that you have made is where you're going to end up. And that's the joy that we carry with us. It's not as if we walk around all day as if we've sucked a coat hanger and we're smiling. It's a case where we have to and know that, that, that one day we are going to be with him, and that day is coming very soon. You know, all of these things we see, all of these troubles, all of the, the catastrophes throughout the world, Jesus says, when you see these things happen, the end is not yet. He says, but these are the birth pangs. He says, so therefore, stand up, because your redemption is drawing near. The next time we see Jesus, Christ will not be him coming here on a white horse uh, to judge the world. The next time we see him as believers is when we go to meet him in the air. And that's what's important. Uh, uh, you know, there's obviously, you're reading a scripture behind me, and, and that scripture has uh, it causes a lot of people to be fearful. <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, I want to just explain a couple of things. And when we come to church, yes, we come and, and we we do good praise and worship, and we enjoy the praise and worship, and we go out feeling good. But we go back out, back out again into the world, and we have to mix with people. We've got to <clears throat> live with, with in, in communities. We've got to go to the shops. We've got to socialize, and we just can't always live in a in a bubble. We've got to be realistic, and. Um, I spoke a couple of weeks ago about it being a time where the, the, the Jewish people call it Rosh Hashanah. The Bible calls it Yom Teruah, the day of the blast, the loud blast, the shrilling blast. In fact, it means a blast that goes right through you. And the Jewish people from that day until Yom Kippur, they actually start talking about forgiveness and, and approaching people to forgive them. Like, as it so happens that this evening is the start of Yom Kippur. And it is a, uh, it's a festival in, in, uh, well, for the Jewish people. And Jerusalem, everything stops. Uh, everything stops. They're, when I say everything stops, everything stops. The lifts and the, and the elevators don't work. And, and the, the, the cars don't go on the road. And it is, everything stops. The men aren't allowed to wear uh, leather shoes. Or anybody's not allowed to wear leather shoes. Um, they're not allowed to wear perfume. They're not allowed to uh, bathe. They've got to stay like that. And the reason for that is it's to keep uh, themselves as humble as possible. The, the, the saying uh, that they've got is, Gemar Chatana Tova, which means, may you be sealed. And what they mean by that is that when they believe at Rosh Hashanah, where we have a, a new year and we have new year festivals and new year's uh, People are, are shouting Happy New Year and, and, and expressing the, the, and welcoming the new year in. They don't do that at Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a time of reflection. It's a time of when they've got to look into themselves and it's a time of repentance uh, that they've got to go through. And they are hoping, they believe then that, that God has judged them, that sealed them, sealed them, 
so that when it comes to, like this evening of Yom Kippur, that they will not be judged. So therefore, what that means, Gemar uh, Chanatana and Shoba, means, it means, may you be sealed. And we as Christians, we don't, we don't have to think like that. We, we, the reason we know of, of uh, and the reason I keep bringing out the, the Hebrew or the Hebraic through uh, his teachings is because that's what Christianity came out of. Jesus was a Jew. His disciples were Jews. The first early church were all Jews. And you could see the Old Testament, everything there was had Jesus stamped all over their festivals, their feasts, everything that they did. It was about their Messiah that was coming and they just rejected him. And then when they rejected Jesus, it gave the Gentiles, people like you and I, a chance to accept him. Because let's be honest, I mean, the Jews haven't got a great reputation for giving stuff away. So, you, you know, it would have been more difficult to, you know, they would have probably held on to him. But we were able to uh, be enlightened, is the word. Be enlightened that, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one. And that's what I, that's why I talk about it. But I want to talk about something else. We come to church and we, 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 we sing songs and we praise God and we talk about Jesus. And, and it's important to do that. But I want to tell you what's, what really, really is important. And that is really to get to know, have an intimate relationship with Father God. That's what it's, that's what it's about. It's having a, a, we get together, we have fellowship one with another, we talk to one another, we, we you know, we, uh, this, this uh, Thursday the ladies are getting together and they're going to have a good old uh, chat, a good chin wag. And that's, that's good. That's good that, 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 that happens and that get together. And it's important that, that, that we understand that what God wants to do, he wants to be like our father. Now, there are some people who have had maybe bad relations with their, with their own um, fleshly parents, and, but God is not a man that he can be mocked. He's not a man that he can lie, and he's not a God that gives you a promise and, will, and then will, will take it away. He wants to, be, he wants to have that intimate intimate relationship where he wants to know you uh, he knows you but he wants you to know him and he wants to know that you and him are together in a, in a real close relationship and that's why we have churches we don't have churches to have huge congregations and, and to have lots of money in the bank we don't have churches just to walk around with the biggest bible you've ever seen or to be uh, seen up uh, talking and, and thinking well oh he, he knows it. it's nothing about that it's the relationship is not between you and your bank account or you and, and your bible or you, the relationship is between you and Father God. Now I, I was brought up in a, a tenement in the back streets of Belfast and on a two up and two down uh, house, no garden. You walk out the front door, you get knocked down by a bicycle. It was as simple as fact that it did. It was as simple as that. And we had a, a, a room where we lived with a TV set, and we had a little uh, place. You would call it a kitchen, they call it a scullery. It was so thin and so narrow, you could hardly get down to cook. The bedrooms upstairs, we had two. I had three sisters, mother and father. There, were, there was... Um, Six of us, <laughs> six of us living in two bedrooms. And that went on for ages. But you know what? We were happy. We went out in the streets. We played. We, you know, with our, we had no TV in the early days. And, and it was, but we were so happy. And, and, and we had such a good relationship with each other. The, our family had, was, it was a real family time. And it was a time when we, we got together and we laughed. Everything was funny. I mean, uh, growing up in Ireland, uh, you know, even things that weren't funny were funny. We used to laugh and, and, and joke and carry on. And I had three sisters, and, and I don't know what was in my mother's head, but and they were we were all six years apart. 
So I, yeah, I was, the, I was the youngest one, and my next uh, sister the elder, uh, is six years older than me, and then one was six years older than the other was six. I don't know what, what happened every six year, um, but certainly that's that's the way it worked out. But well, the, the sister that was that was closest, say closest to me to, to, to in years. Was was my sister who was? We went to the same school. We we, and she would take me as a kid. And I remember being, I must have been about four or five. And she would put me into one of those toy. It was like a toy pram. You know, a perambula where they push kids around in. Um, what they're called now, push chairs and stuff. But this was, you know, the the, the one that goes shakes and goes all over the place. And she would put me in that, and she would run me everywhere. I mean, she would run me everywhere, up and down steps. She would bump me up and down the curbs, and the curbs were made of granite. They weren't like sort of gently, they were thick. And I, my head was falling all over the I was like one of those little nodding dogs that you get in the back of a car. I was all over the place. And I, I loved it, and she loved it, because she loved to see me getting the... the uh, she wasn't doing it to hurt me or to scare me. Maybe she was to scare me, but she was doing it because we had that relationship together. We would go to a place, we call it the fairy steps. It was a whole row of steps going down. There must have been about 25 steps leading from one area to another area. And she would bounce me down all of those steps and then pull me back up all the way back up again. And at the end of the whole thing, and, uh, it, it was uh, exhilarating, but it was something that you could feel that, that there was something there. My dad was a laborer in a shipyard. Um, but yet of all, he was able to... My mom didn't work. Um, she worked, didn't work when, when, when I was born, but she worked obviously before that. But he was a laborer. He was getting peanuts as a laborer in the shipyard. But he was able to save money so that he could take the family on a holiday. Not, I want to say a holiday... Uh, we went uh, maybe about 20 miles away to a to, uh, seashore and stayed in a caravan for a couple of weeks. But we did it every year, and, and he was able to do that on that. And we, we came together, and we would lie in bed at night, and we would play I Spy with my little... That was, a, you know, we didn't have cell phones. I Spy with my little I something beginning with... And then it would be something to totally different. Somebody would say, beginning with G... And I'd say, oh, we go through everything, you know. And then it would end up being, it was a light bulb. I said, well, a light bulb is with an L. I said, yeah, we just thought it would make the game a little bit longer. You know, and, 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 and you know, it, it was one of those, we, we, we always had fun. We were, we were always together. We, we knew. I, I was sent to Sunday school. My parents didn't go to church when I was a child. And they sent me to Sunday school. I don't know what, what Sunday school was. I didn't know who was a Baptist, or I found out later, but I mean, uh, it was brethren. We apparently was very strict. But uh, I, I didn't know. It was a Sunday school. And I went across the road. I used to go to the Sunday school, and I, I would sit there, and they would come back. When I came back, they'd ask me, what was I taught today? And I would say to them, well, they were speaking about you. They said, well, what were they talking about? I said, sinners. And... And uh, my dad said, that wasn't funny. I don't know, no, but I just thought it slipping in anyway. We, we, we just could joke with one another, and we could do that. I remember one time at the Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher, there must have been about seven or eight of us in the Sunday school class, and the Sunday school teacher said to me, do, do you have a Bible? And I said, no, I don't have one. And I didn't have a Bible. And I used to get every year, you know, the, uh, for attendance, they give us little... Pictures and, and uh, sort of what, we would, what you would see today, maybe on Facebook, little posters with, with scriptures on it, and they would give you one of those for attendance. I got it for attendance every year. It wasn't always listening, but it was, oh, it was attendance. I was there, and, and he said, "I said, no, I don't have a Bible." He says, "I've got one for you." I said, oh, "Thank you so much." And you know, I, I can see this man's face right now, and I was so happy and, and excited. And he said, but I've got it at home. He said, you'd have to come home with me to get it. And I thought, well, that's fine. I, I mean, he said, right, we'll go across. We stood at a bus stop, and nobody had cars where we lived. We stood at a bus stop across the road from, the, from the, the little church, and I was standing there with him waiting for a bus to go back. Now, at this age, I was about six years old, to go back with this man, who I didn't know, to his house to get a Bible. And I was gullible enough to think, 
Well, that's great. I'm going to get a Bible. My sister, who used to run all over the place in a pram, she, she sensed it and she came across and she said, Mom and Dad said, you must come home, but you must come home now. And I said, but, and she says, there's no buts. They said, now. And I left. And she obviously saved me from something that was going to happen to me because I knew only later did I realize that this was a stupid thing. Nobody would have done that. And I was gullible and, and innocent enough to think, well, I'm going to go to this old man's house and, and all I'm going to have is a Bible. That's great. And I never even thought about where he lived. I didn't even think about how I was going to get home again. But my sister says that she knew me. She had an intimate relationship. She knew what was going on. She knew what was going on in the time of what was going. When I got a bit older um, and uh, I was turning about 16 and I, I was working and uh, I worked in a department store and uh, used to get in in the morning and the first thing I had to do in the department store was brush the floor. And it was a huge department store. It was like what started for us was like, it was huge. And I would have to brush the floor. And there was a lot of young ladies who were the shop assistants. So I used to get in really early so that I could brush the floor of the department store before they, they, could, they could see me doing it. And, I, and then one day, then obviously I got caught on and uh, I wasn't the, the, the shop hero. I was the little guy that brushed the, the floor of the shop. And on the way home, Wednesday was always a half day in the UK. It was not Saturdays, it was Wednesday. And I used to stop up visit my sister by this time she was married and we would sit and we would laugh and we would tell jokes and you know we would even go to funerals and laugh i mean that's hard it was because of not, not because we would, oh, let's go to a funeral and have a laugh no it was a case of that's the way we were that's the way we grew up we were intimate together and as much as that we knew each other we knew our thoughts and we knew what each other was thinking and that's basically what I want to say about what God wants us to be like with him. Now, Matthew seven twenty one behind me says, Not everyone, Jesus is talking now. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The word Lord, Lord. And, and, and I, I like to go into the, the actual scriptures to explain them a little bit better. Lord, Lord would, would mean master, master, or, or, or teacher, teacher. He said, we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. The other gospels, they talk about the kingdom of God. And what is the difference, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? There's no difference. It's the kingdom belongs to God. Okay, in, in Hebrew, heaven is shalom. And shalom it means God. So it's the kingdom of, as Matthew said, the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, many will say to me on that day, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the day of judgment. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, remember, we're, we're talking about a time here in the first century in Jerusalem when Jesus is telling what it's going to be like at the end times. And he's telling the people that this is what's going to happen to, at the end times. There are going to be people who are prophesying. Uh, we see it on television more and more and regular and regular. We see prophets. We see false prophets. We see prophets who make fun of God. We see prophets who, who make all sorts of promises and things that, that we just know are not right. He said, there are people who are going to say, but we called you Lord, and we did this for you, and we did that, and we worked for you, and we, you know, we, we attended, and we, we got the, the, this little plaque for attendance. That is not what church is about. That, that, in fact, church is just means a gathering of people. 
We gather together so that we can lift one another up. We can exhort one another. We can say, hey, I've got a problem. Can, can, you know, can you pray for me? Can you help me? Can you? We come together to do that. We come together to learn. Because amongst us, there will be people who can teach God's Word. And we learn from that. And we just don't read it and think, because we've got to remember that the, the New Testament was written in Greek. It wasn't written in English, so in the translation, sometimes you can get a different translation, and you may pick up the wrong idea. But here we see it's pretty. It looks pretty good. He says, "I will declare to them, I never knew you." And, and the idea is, the word there is, "I never knew you." But but we 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 cast out demons in your name. How can how can you not say you don't know us? We we prophesied in your in your name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua. We prophesy, and you say you never knew us. And what he's talking about there is something that's different. It's something that's intimate. This is is the is a Hebrew text. Okay, it says at the top, Yada. That's how it's pronounced, Yada. And Yada means knowing God. That, this comes from Isaiah, but it's used hundreds of times in the Bible. And this is what Jesus is saying. Yada, I never knew you intimately. I, 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 you didn't know me well enough. You, didn't, you were doing things for the wrong reason. You were doing it because of out of habit. You were giving because you thought the more you give, the more you're going to get. That, that, that you did it because you're looking for approval as, a, as opposed to having an intimate relationship, like a family intimate relationship. Yada. It's made up of two words. And of course, you read Hebrew back to front. So being Irish, it's easy for me. We'll not talk about the rugby last night. It was Ireland, I thought, played very well. The word that you see on the left, you read there, is Dalet. And the other word is Ayin. And there are two letters, sorry. But every Hebrew letter has got a meaning. Okay? So it's not just a letter, but it has a meaning. And the word Dalet that you see, as you look there on your right, on the extreme right, and you will see that the lead actually means door. And ayin means I. But when you put them both together, it means knowing intimately. Now, that is the Hebrew thought. That's the way they think. And it's not like what we've been taught in the West. You know, in the West... We think that everything centers around America and Europe, and, 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 and it doesn't. The center, the epicenter, is going to be Israel. That's where things are going to happen. Yada, written there in Hebrew. Now, what you probably didn't know is that that type of Hebrew writing wasn't the writing from the very beginning, the Hebrew writing from the beginning. This writing happened after the Israelites were, were released from Babylon. That, that writing there is, is Aramaic Hebrew, and it's called the square alphabet. You can see it's pretty square looking. And that is the, what they, the, they eventually adopted as a Hebrew language. The actual language, well, the language didn't change, but the actual writing of it down changed. It used to be called Paleo-Hebrew, which was pictorial. In other words, like pictures. So I want to show you what it, what it would have liked. The Ten Commandments, for example, weren't, wasn't written in that Hebrew uh, lettering. It was written in Paleo-Hebrew. And that is Paleo-Hebrew. Now, <laughs> that doesn't look like much. Okay, that is the word Dalet, or the letter Dalet, which means door. Now, you can see the, the top bar is the, 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 the top bar of the entrance of the tent. Remember, they were no, nomads. They, they lived in tents. And that hanging down, that banner hanging down, is the door. It's the flap. It, it, it moved backwards and forwards. 
it, 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 it's the entrance, it's how you get in. That's the word Dalet. And then if we put the other word, which was called Ayin, it means I. And that's what it looked like. So there you've got the I and you've got the door. And what that would that, what that means is yada, the same word that we, that we just seen. But how do they get yada? It's because when when you examine something, if you go, if you're selling a, a fruit, or if you're buying fruit, or or if you're buying something, you will pick it up and you will run your eye over it so that you may you will know that it's that it's in good condition. And that's what it means. The eye will look because the door goes to and fro, and the eye will look, and the t together it will be a to and fro an inspection. But it means that you become more intimate with the object, and the object in this case, when we have God as our Father, is us and Him. He looks at us, and He will examine us. And we will look at him and we will accept him. And that is why Jesus said that not everyone, because God has inspected, he knows your heart. He knows everything. You know, I've often heard people say, oh, I do this, but God knows my heart. Of course he knows your heart. But the thing is, do you know his heart? Do you know have the heart of God? We believe, or we often believe, that in the Old Testament, God was so harsh and so severe, and in the New Testament, when Jesus came along, God got saved, and he became okay. But you see what, the, what it is, yada, it's to know him intimately. It's to know that he is running his eye to and fro over us, not judging us. When we have a child, and when, 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 when Nolene has Daniel and, and they go out on the street, she is watching him. She is looking for traffic. She's looking for problems. She's looking for incidents that might harm him. She's got an intimate relationship with her son. And that's what God wants with us. He just doesn't want sacrifices. He does. Do you honestly think that he needs your money? Your church needs your money because we've got to pay the rent. But God doesn't need your money. He's the, he's the one that, that will, he wants to look after you. He is your provider. He's your protector. He is the one who gives us the nourishment. And how do we get nourishment? From the word of God. And he wants to take the fear that I spoke about earlier totally away because he says that he is watching you like a watching the to and fro, the, like the flap of the tent that opens and shuts, he will be running his eye over. And he, he, he will. there are times in my life where I have, didn't know it, but God has obviously protected me. I shared one this morning with you about the Sunday school teacher. That was one time when God protected me. He used my sister to do it. And I'm sure you can believe, and I know for a fact as a young man, when I was driving my cars and at the weekend, God had his hand on me many, many times, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here today. But we got to understand this is what's important. You're giving. You give what you can. And what you can't give, you don't get upset about it. You, you do what you can, and if you can't do everything, you do not get upset about it. What you must do is just have a relationship, a yada, a, 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 an intimate relationship with God. Speak to Him every time. You can speak to Him when you're driving your car. You can speak to Him when you're on the toilet. You can speak to Him. You can have that relationship with Him. I remember I was being taught years ago at a church, and the, the pastor was, he was very uh, cool. Let's just say, I think that's the word that, that he was cool. Yeah, he wore a t shirt and jeans. And, and, and that was back in the day when nobody wore a t shirt and jeans. It was always like me. And, and, and he was saying, someone questioned him and said, Don't you have respect that you wear a tie and a, and a, and a suit? And he said, listen, he says, my God sees me when I'm in the bath. He says, why must I dress up for him on, a, on one day a week? 
And that is so true. Um, and, and that is the intimate relationship that God wants to have. The Father, the Father God, Jesus taught us how to pray. He says, you pray to the Father. And we pray through the character and name of Jesus because we recognize that Jesus is the only way. Everything points to God and the, the Spirit. You know, there are some people pray to the Holy Spirit. You do not pray to the Holy Spirit either. You pray to the Father. It's the Spirit that prompts you. And the Spirit's job is not to convict you of your sin. You read in the book of John, what is the Holy Spirit's job? is to convince you of your righteousness. Do you know how hard that is for people to understand that they are actually righteous when they believe in Jesus? You think, oh, I did that, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wrong, I, I repent. I'm like, yes, it's good to acknowledge and to look at yourself inwardly. But the Holy Spirit's job is to convince you, to convince you that you are righteous in the sight of God whose eye is watching every movement in you, around you, through you, and to you. And you've just got to understand that, that the relationship that you build is a relationship with, uh, with, with the Father of... Uh, Jesus, obviously, is... is I was reading a book the other day and they were saying because the Jewish people do not believe because we, they say we believe in three gods the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit now when we read the Bible and we look it through a Hebrew mindset I remember we look things through a Hebrew mindset because that's how Jesus was brought up he looked at things through a Hebrew mindset now when we look at it I was sitting in my, my lounge and I looked and I've, we've got a wall unit and we've got you know, the three wall units and you push them together and the middle one's got the TV I don't know if you've got that but that's what I've had for years but it's, a, it's called a unit it's a wall unit it's, a, it's one unit and God is a unit he's made up of the Godhead we sang it this morning but it is, it's one unit. Elohim is a plural name, and that's the God that we serve. And Yada. What does Yada mean in relation to God? Yada, the Hebrew word meaning to know. Remember what he said, I never knew you. Is used multiple times throughout Scripture for a variety of different topics. However, when the term is used to define the yada as the relationship between man and God, it speaks of a deep intimacy that the Father longs to have with his children. Thank you for this.